We're about to have some fun. I want you to turn to Psalm 8 and Hebrews 2.10. Psalm 8, Hebrews 2.10. <clears throat> I come from a shouting, snot slinging, baby tossing, take off your sandal, hit your neighbor hitting, <laughs> lap running, clothes stuck to your church. If y'all sit down on me, it's going to hurt my feelings this morning. So I want you to know, by the time I get through preaching, my tie could be off, my vest buttons could be popped, and uh, I have, I, I'm not responsible for what's going to happen in the next few minutes. <laughs> but if you feel like running, run. I'll catch you the second time around. Hallelujah. My shoes are a little slippery. I got to be careful on the corners. But other than that, I'll catch you. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 8, and then I'm going to read Hebrews 2.10. And I'm going to put on these glasses, not because I need them to read, but I like their fashion. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who hath set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babe and nursing infants you have ordained strength. Because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man you would visit him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. Stop right there. I would not want the job of having to translate the Bible into another language. I so respect the Bible translators who will run down into the bush regions of Africa and learn a tribal tongue and then translate the whole Bible. I, I, that amazes me. But the fact is there are things in translation that get left out. And... That does not say that he made us a little lower than the angels. The translators dumb that down because the indication of this passage is so great if we take it in its literal form that for the translators it was too heavy so they did not translate it accurately. That word there is not angels. That word there is Elohim. He did not make you lower than the angels. In fact, you have the ability to command angels. There's no way he made you lower than that which you have authority over. The Bible says he made you a little lower than himself. Remember, when he made you, he made his kind. So he made me a little lower than himself. Look what he did. When he made man, he crowned him, <coughs> pardon me, with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion. You have made him to have dominion. Who has dominion? Man. Somebody say, who has dominion? Man. Then why do we get up and say God is in control? Every preacher, including me, has spread it. Well, God is in control. God. You know what that's code for? I have no idea how that happened. If I'm reading my Bible right, the Bible says God is in ownership. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But how many of you have ever rented or leased anything? In a lease, you do not own it, but you are in charge of the activities during the duration of your lease. Can I tell you something? Man is in dominion. God is not in control of the earth. He's in ownership. I know that's going to trouble some of you. But if God was in control, it wouldn't look like it does. If God was in control, he'd have this thing fixed by lunchtime. Some of y'all just sitting right down on me right there. That's all right. That's all right. I'm gonna make, if that makes you uncomfortable, you're going to be tore. You're going to need, you're going to need rash cream before I get through with you though. I'm just reading the Bible. I know we love that God is in control message. We sing it. We preach it. But when a tsunami comes in and floods a city, when ISIS attacks, when an earthquake rocks a city or nation, we don't know what to do, so we say God is in control. God didn't send a tornado through Oklahoma and wipe out a subdivision and kill 27 people. 
The Bible says that the earth was subjected to futility. It don't know what to do. It's reeling and rocking like a drunk man. The earth don't know what. It has no one to govern it. The rain don't know how much to rain because it has nobody to tell it when to stop. The wind don't know whether to be a breeze or a hurricane because no one is there to have authority over it. I'm preaching. It's going to be a rough day. I'm going to have y'all's nerves so tore up. I done ruined your whole theology in my first five minutes. I'm just reading it. You made him to have dominion over what? Over all the works of your hands. You put all things under whose feet? His. All sheep, oxen, and beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea that pass through the sea. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Hebrews 2 and verse 10. I'll tell you what. I don't know if I want to read that one or not. I don't know if I'm going to get that far. Let me stop right there and wait on that one. Well, no, let me read it. Let me read it. Let me read Let me go ahead. Hebrews 2 and verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons, many sons. God crowned Adam with glory and honor, but it was fitting for him to bring many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Lord, bless your word, and everyone said amen. amen. Tap your neighbor on both sides and say, here we go, here we go. <laughs> Roll with me a minute, okay? Let's have some fun. Tell your neighbor, say, loosen up a little bit. Loosen up. Yeah, that dominion thing, I can tell it about made your egg come back up. <clears throat> when God created the heavens and the earth, you've got to understand that God never intended for earth to operate separate from heaven. He intended earth to operate and be governed just like heaven was governed. God made an invisible realm. He is an invisible God. Invisible does not pertain to the object. It pertains to the subject. It does not mean that the object is not there. It means your eye does not have the ability to pick up the image. The Bible tells us that the invisible world is the parent world, that the, that the invisible is the parent, the parent world is the subject world. In other words, the Bible says the things that have been made were made out of things not seen. So in other words, the things that you can't see are more real than the pew that's holding you up right now. There is a world whirling above your head that your eye cannot pick up the image. And every once in a while in the Bible, God would open up somebody's eyes when they thought they were all alone and let them know there are more for you than there are against you. Is anybody in this building? <laughs> so God made the invisible realm. The invisible realm is for God. The Bible says in Psalms, the, heaven is for, the heavens are for God, the earth is for the sons of men. So God made earth a visible expression of an invisible heaven. And then he made man a visible expression of an invisible God. <clears throat> and what he wanted was he wanted earth to be governed just like heaven is governed. And he put Adam there and then he crowned what was made in his likeness with honor and glory. The word glory means weight. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the word glory. I taught 63 Wednesday nights on the word glory. Almost a year and a quarter, I was going to do a four-part series on the word glory, and when I got through, it lasted over a year. Because <laughs> most of us, can I just tell you, how many of y'all were raised in churches like me? I was raised in the old holiness church. Anybody raised like that? Okay. I'm, I'm, no, I'm talking about, old holiness church I'm talking about if it was fun it was wrong if it makes you grin it must be sin I'm talking I'm talking about grandmama coming to church barefooted 4700 bobby pins holding up at beehive and if that thing she ever got to shout in the beehives were like a machine gun going off across the building. And by the time she got through, her hair was on the ground like Rapunzel. Because she hadn't cut it since she was eight years old. 
I'm talking about the women could wear no makeup and the men the sleeves to hear none. And we thought that made us holy. And I figured out one day it didn't make us holy. It made us ugly. <laughs> My mama would tell me, you're going to marry one of these nice little girls in this church. And I'd look around that building. I'd say, Mom, <laughs> I ain't marrying nobody. I ain't marrying nobody in this church. Somebody got to find some paint and put it on their face. Before I married them, these are some ugliest girls I've seen in my life. I can't wake up every morning and look at this. They might be holy, but they ugly. I don't care. It don't matter if you glow in the dark if I can't stand to look at you. I did. That's what, that's what I was raised in. And so I would hear, I would hear the word glory. Most of the time I would hear the word glory, Brother Woodson, when they would shout. Because we had, good God, we had the shouting as people. Shout. Say, they shout, and I, you know, we didn't have no children's church back then. You just lay on your mama's pew right beside her lap. You couldn't sit with your friends. You sat with your mama. And she had fingernails about that long if you got the twitching after four hours in church. She'd take the inside of your thigh. Anybody, y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. And she'd take her fingernails and pinch that thing, and you let out a shout, and then the women thought you didn't got the Holy Ghost, and they start shouting another hour. <laughs> That's what I was raised in. That's what I came from. And uh, so I would hear them, oh, glory, you know, and, they, and they, nobody does that much anymore, but I'm, glory. Hey, hey, no. glory. I get the shoulders into it and pop them. Oh. <laughs> so I said, okay, glory is what you do when you shout. Then I listened to our songs over in the glory land. I said, well, glory must not be a shouting term. It must be heaven. It must be talking about the next life. And so I listen. I watch what they do and I listen to what they say. And you, you get bad theology from bad music. And then I got to studying that word, and I thought, man, this word sure is used a lot. I wonder what it means. And if you try to pertain it to heaven all the way through the Bible, that dog don't hunt. <laughs> and so I said, there's something more to this word than we know. The word glory in the Old Testament means weight. It means weight. So what God did was he put Adam in the earth and then he crowned him with the thing that only he had, glory. He put it on Adam, which means when Adam would speak in the earth, it would have the same effect as God. Come on, roll with me. So he took the weight that he had, and so Adam could be in the earth, and when Adam would speak, heaven would back up what Adam would say, and he would get godly results even though he was a man in the earth. Because when he spoke, he was crowned with the weight. In other words, when he spoke, God would get behind what he would say and make what he would say happen. That's why the Bible says whatever Adam called it, that's what it was. Oh, hallelujah. Keep rolling. I'm still in the, we still ramping up. I ain't got you up to the peak yet. I'm going to preach you up a mountain and we're going to grab hands and jump off together. Hallelujah. <laughs> so he crowned them with glory. No, no. God never meant for his words just to be used to communicate. God uses words to create. That's right. So when God speaks, God uses words to create. We use words to talk. But when God uses words, he wants something to spring into being that was not. Because faith calls things that be not as though they were. So he gave Adam the power to govern the earth just like he governed the heavens. Stay with me. That means the earth was never meant to respond to Adam's hands. The earth was meant to respond to his words. You never hear anything about sweat, toil, or work till after the curse. When Adam, before he sinned and lost the glory, he would speak 
and the elements would respond to the sound of his voice because God put him in the earth to govern the earth just like he governed the heavens and whenever Adam spoke that's what it was whenever God spoke that's what it was and you know what is hilarious to me that all creation went around five days not knowing what it was because Adam was not up there till the sixth day then God rested on the seventh so for five days, all the, atom, all the animals are walking around and have no idea who they are. Can you see that? Can you see the sheep walking up to the line and say, are we supposed to like hang out or do you eat me? Or what? I don't know how this works. And, you know, the chicken going up to the, the, the giraffe, who are you? I don't know, who are you? And the pine tree leaning over to the oak tree. Nothing had an identity because Adam was put there to give it its identity. Adam was put there to govern the earth with God's authority. The elements were meant to respond to his voice. So whatever Adam called it, that's what it became because when Adam spoke, he spoke with heaven backing up everything he said. Tap your neighbor on three sides. Say it's time to get back to understanding our power. Come on, tell him. It's time to get back to understanding our power. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <clears throat> All right, now I'm going to build something here. I'm line upon line, precept upon precept. So the Bible says that Adam was told that there are two trees in the midst of the garden. I did some study on that and spoke about it back at my conference back in May and because I saw something I'd never seen. I'd always been taught that there was the, you know, we all, we all get, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil gets all the press, but there were two trees. There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then there was the tree of life. And the Bible says they were in the midst of the garden, which we always thought they were in the center of it. The word midst does not mean in the middle. It means suspended. So there were two trees that were suspended. Trees with no roots but had fruit. Let that one sink in a minute. <laughs> there were two trees in the garden and the Bible says God put every seed in the ground and every tree for fruit. But there were two trees that were not rooted in the ground. They were suspended in midair. So what does this mean? That means there were two trees that did not have their roots in the ground because their fruit did not touch the natural man. In other words, if it came out of the ground, it feeds my flesh. These two trees had their roots in the heavenlies. So in other words, they were rooted in the spirit, which meant if you ate from them, they had an effect on your spirit. Y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. And God said, we think that Adam got thrown out of the garden as the punishment for sin. He didn't get thrown out punishment for sin. God said, go read it in Genesis 3. Now that he has eaten from the knee of tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we've got to get him out of the garden and protect him from the tree of life. Why? Because if he eats from the tree of life after he's eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he will be dead forever. So God didn't put him out for punishment. God put him out for protection. Why do you think Satan can't be saved? Because he didn't sin in time. He sinned in eternity. Some of y'all done a whole lot worse stuff than the devil. And God saved you. Why can't Satan be saved? Because we sinned in time. He sinned in eternity. When he sins in eternity, you're lost forever. So if Adam would have ate from the tree of life after he was spiritually dead, then he would have been spiritually dead eternally. And God said, if I'm going to work my plan, I can't let him touch that other tree. Because Revelation 2 says that the tree of life is in the center of heaven and the paradise of God. So he would have eaten from a tree that was suspended and had its roots in heaven. If you sin and then eat from something from heaven, then what you ate from lasts forever. And y'all are just going. Are you following me? I'm going to tell you something. They don't mean I got 20 minutes left, so you know what that means? I got a long way to go and a short time to get there. 
Okay? Now, <clears throat> let me work with this. So Adam ate from the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Bible says that that day he died. Well, his flesh didn't die because the tree's out of the ground is what feeds your flesh. Where did he die? Spiritually. He ate from the trees that were rooted in the heavenlies, not the ground. And so spiritually he died. Thus Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the in other words, now Adam is trapped in a world that no longer responds to him. In other words, Adam talks and heaven does not back him up. And Romans 8, the earth is in the pains ah, of childbirth. Ah, it's groaning with another earthquake. It's groaning with another war. It's groaning with terror. It's groaning with earthquakes. It's groaning with hurricanes. What's happening? Because the Bible says it was subjected to futility. Listen, not willingly, but because of he who subjected it. The earth never wanted to be in this condition. But the one who was sent with honored and crowned with glory to have dominion in it lost his dominion. And now Adam is in a world and he speaks and nothing happens. And he runs to try to get fig leaves to cover up his sinfulness. And he can't get himself covered. Why? Because Adam was like his father. He didn't wear normal clothes. God is arraigned, clothed in glory and honor. Adam said he was naked when he sinned. A lot of people say, well, sin made him so that he was consciously nude and naked. Listen, that ain't, sin didn't teach him about nakedness. When God pulled Eve out of his side and he wakes up and Eve's standing there naked, God said, be fruitful and multiply. Do I need to explain that? Do I need to do a Hebrew word study on there's a naked woman when he wakes up and God says, all right, be fruitful, multiply. Sin didn't teach him about nakedness. In other words, he was arraigned in the same clothes of his father. His father wore glory and honor, and he realized after he sinned, his glory was gone. For all have sinned and lost the glory of God. So he went to try to get another covering to back him up so that when he would speak, it would still work. He went and got fig leaves. And then here comes Jesus, and Jesus only cursed one thing. What did he curse? The fig. Why? Because God says, I will forever curse man's attempt to fix the problem of sin. This is not a man victory. Salvation is God's victory. Salvation belongs unto to our God, and there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. Take five seconds and give your Savior a shout. Hallelujah! Yeah. Hallelujah! Mm. High five, a couple of people say, sit back down, he's going somewhere, he's going somewhere. <laughs> Hey. Hallelujah. Oh, some of y'all ain't with me yet. Hallelujah. I feel like there's some glory arising in this building. I feel like there's some weight coming back to your words. There's some mountains you're about to move. Hey, I feel the glory of God arising in this place. Somebody lift up a shout and send it all the way back to your house and let your mouth move your mountain. Yeah. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Right, I gotta go, 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 I gotta go. So in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. Everything was made by him and nothing, nothing was made without him. Going down John verse 12 through 14. And the word became flesh. That's usually where we start running and shouting. Usually the revelation is right past the verse where everybody starts shouting. The next verse says, and we beheld. Oh. 
for 4,000 years, there's been no glory. Some of us don't know what Jesus came to do. If you want to know what Jesus came to bring you, study what the first Adam lost. And when you find out what the first Adam lost, you'll find out what Jesus came to restore. And it wasn't just to get you a ticket to heaven. It was to restore your authority and kingdom in the earth. I know you can't clap right now, but give me these last few minutes. I'm going to work it. I'm going to work it. <laughs> and we beheld glory. What is the first thing Jesus starts doing? He starts talking to stuff. Faith people talk to stuff. You've got to risk looking crazy and not worry about the opinions of others. <laughs> See, some of you, you've got to understand that one of the indicators that you have no goals is when other people's opinion becomes your goal. <laughs> and you have got to speak faith not worried about the opinions of others because God takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And it looks stupid to people when you start talking to stuff, but Jesus knows what it means to speak and heaven back up what you say. So here comes Jesus. Jesus don't start fixing things with his hands because after the curse, then Adam is only bringing forth fruit by the work of his hands. The earth was not meant to respond to his hands. It was meant to respond to his mouth. And the earth has had nobody talk to it. So here comes Jesus. He speaks into a tomb and a corpse named Lazarus comes out of. He didn't anoint him with oil. He didn't go in there with a worship team. He just talks to it and it comes back to life and it pops out of the tomb. He walks up to a tree and says, may nobody ever eat from you again. The tree immediately dies. He talks to water and water quits filling the boat. He speaks to the fish, and the fish begin to fill up the net. Y'all ain't saying nothing. He speaks to wind, and wind quits blowing. Y'all ain't saying nothing. What, who is this man? What manner of man is this? When he speaks, he has such authority. What kind of man is this that when he speaks, the wind and the waves even obey what he has to say? What manner of man is it? I'll tell you what it is. It is a man carrying the glory of God on his life. Anybody want to live like that? Shout amen. you got to sit down. I got to go quick. Ah! That's what I do when I don't know what to do. Ah! Some of y'all need to give a ah! praise. That's... Ooh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I wish I had time. <laughs> Ooh, I feel this. I'm on Holy Ghost. I'm sorry. I, I can't do all this new stuff and show you a video and get you home in an hour. I'm Holy Ghost. I want the blind to see, the lame to walk, the deaf to hear. I want to speak to mountains and they move. I want to speak to cancer and it fall off. I want to tell you to be free and change, loose your body. I'm ready to see a people covered and smeared in the glory of God begin to understand we walk with power and we were meant to rule our world under the glory of God. Shout hallelujah. Somebody say, I can't hardly stand it. I can't hardly stand it. So much glory, so much, so much power, so much. Yeah. Please let me finish. He's walking in glory. And people have not seen it, so when they see it, they don't understand it. And they start saying, what, ma what did they marvel at? When he speaks, things move. When the Pharisees talk, nothing happens. But when this guy talks... 
See, you, I wish I had time. Because James says that God wants you to be a first fruits of his kind. What did they say? What kind of man is this? Jesus didn't come so he could show off what kind he was. He came to let you be the first fruits of his. What did God make when he made Adam? He made him after his. This is word right here. I'm laying some word on you. I'm laying some word on you. Yeah. This ain't an insure protein drink. This right here is cube steak and gravy. You're going to have to put this in your jaw and chew it all weekend. <laughs> so Hebrews 2, I got to move quick. Hebrews 2. Let me move back. Better ask forgiveness than permission. <laughs> and when you speak, be careful how you speak because God lets you determine the criteria for your faith. Be careful the place you tell God to meet you at. The woman with the issue of blood set the criteria. Well, for me, if I can touch, why did she set those parameters? Those were the parameters she set, not God. Thomas, well, if I see. So here Jesus is. But then what does he tell him? Blessed are those yes, sir. who I don't have to move through your calisthenics and jump through your hoops, and yet you believe anyway. Be careful the criteria you set for God. Peter, Lord, if you bid me to come, I'll walk. See, God always lets you set the criteria for your faith. So when you do speak and you do have power, be careful the parameters you set for God. Because God will meet you at the parameters you set. <laughs> so we come to Hebrews. Why did Jesus, you know, all the churches put all their emphasis now on Easter. Death, resurrection, death, resurrection, death, resurrection, death. And I don't minimize that. That's the, that's the center of humanity. The center of our history. But if it was just about death and resurrection, Pastor McCarn, why did God let us see him live? Why did God let us watch him for three and a half years? If you're just about dying, then come in here and die and get on over with it. But we got to watch him. And when we were watching him, we didn't know that we were beholding God's original intent. When God started the thing, the way Jesus operated was what it was supposed to look like for everybody. So he had to send his son and let him walk so that we could behold. I needed to see it. What does someone walking with heaven backing them up look like? Oh, so when heaven backs you up, you can talk to water and you can talk to him. And some of y'all think that God only loves people. Jesus didn't just come to fix people. The Bible didn't say, for God so loved people. He sent his only son. For God so loved the cosmos. God created all of it. He loves all of it. And because he wanted all of it restored to order, God sent his son to redeem all of it. Somebody say all of it. It ain't just people, because if he fixes the people, he'll fix the rest of all of it. For God so loved the world, and he wants it restored to its order, that he sent his son. See, some of you are understanding. I believe in a second coming. I believe in a rapture. I'm going to be on the first load out, as Pastor Parsley has said, for 30 years. 
But you've got to understand, the Bible says, until the gospel of the kingdom is preached to the whole earth, that the end will not come. So you can throw your charts away. Because let me tell you something, not only does the world not know the kingdom, the church don't know the kingdom. I'm preaching right now a message of the kingdom within you. That's what I'm preaching. And I go to places and I talk talking about the kingdom of God being within you and they look at me like a calf at a new gate. So if the church don't know the message of the kingdom, I know the world don't know. So those of you that's got your bags packed, unpack them. Jesus ain't coming Monday. I just lost my whole honorarium. Lost all my CD sales and DVD sales right there. He's coming, but he ain't coming Monday because there's got to be a people in the earth that understands I was not here just to get saved. I was here to put this back, and I was here to put this back, and I'm here to put this back, and I'm here to rule my world. We're here to rule our households, rule our schools, rule our community, rule our city, rule our neighborhood, rule our police force, rule our judicial system, rule our public school system. We were meant to rule and reign. Shout yes if you believe me. All right. I'm down the slow stretch. Sit back down. Sit back down. God Almighty, I feel the presence of God. <clears throat> so Hebrews says, it was fitting for him to raise many sons. Adam was crowned with glory. Follow me. He sinned and lost the glory. Jesus, the second or last Adam, came to restore the glory. While he was here, we beheld the glory. And that was fitting for the captain of our salvation to raise many sons. To make the captain of our salvation perfect. Is there such a thing as imperfect salvation? It's not that the blood of Jesus has imperfections. What it says is until we are restored to glory, we have not taken full advantage of the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ was not to get you to church and paying tithes and singing songs. The blood of Jesus Christ was to have a people in the earth that when they speak, things move and they have a voice and things shift and they can govern their earth and govern their world and when they speak, heaven backs them up. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So Jesus, they get on the boat and the winds and the waves start beating and he goes to sleep. Why? Because he's been teaching them how the glory works. So he goes to sleep and the greatest teachers don't teach you, they demonstrate. And he demonstrated by going to sleep in a storm where it would see if they're getting the concept of glory. Wow. So the wind and the waves start beating. They have no faith. They get afraid. They go and wake Jesus up. Master, care ye not that we perish. He steps out to the bow of the boat, and it doesn't say, and the Lord was frustrated, but read it. You can feel it. Just you can feel it. He gets up. He steps to the bow of the boat. He goes out and rebukes. The winds and the waves, and they're calmed. Now, for those of you that still think God is in control, what did Pastor say last night? He only does what his Father does. He only says what his Father says. Right? Jesus is a man under authority, one with his Father. He only says what he hears his Father say. He only does what, his fa what he sees his Father do. If Jesus would have walked to the bow of the boat and rebuked the storm, and God was in control of the storm, Jesus would have been rebuking his Father. Let me hear a big amen. Well, you know, Ethel, I just don't believe all that he's preaching right now. I just don't believe it. I just don't believe it. I'm trying to help you see how you can get your glory back. So Jesus spins on him and he says, where is your faith? How does faith come? And how does that come? By word. Do you know what Jesus is asking him? Why did you, after watching me operate in the glory, have to come back and wake me up 
Do you not understand that you could have gone to the bow of the boat and done the exact same thing that I did, but you came and asked me to do it? Could it be that some of us are praying for God to do things that you've been given the power to do? Let me go further. Could it be that you're praying for stuff you should be speaking to? Some of you, God didn't want you to pray for it. He wanted you to talk to it. Don't pray about your mountain. Speak to your mountain and tell it to move. Don't pray about your enemy. Tell your enemy to get behind you. Is anybody talking in this? I want to know, do you understand what I'm talking about? Hallelujah. When the will of God is not known, you pray. When the will of God has been established, you speak. Tweet that right there. When the will of God is unknown, pray. When God has made it known what he wants, you speak to it. <clears throat> now, I got I to gotta land this plane. I got to land it. Somebody just high five three people while I drink some water up here. Hallelujah. <laughs> See, some of y'all didn't know me. Y'all let the white skin fool you. Don't let the white skin fool you. <laughs> now, I got some other things. I don't have time. Last point. So we who with unveiled faces, 2 Corinthians 3, 16, 17, 18, all behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory. <laughs> Pastor, you told me we had it. You told me we lost it. You told me Jesus brought it back, and now you tell me it's got levels. I'm already tired, and it's the first service today. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> How do you go to a new glory? Have you ever noticed there's some people that talk all the time and nobody listens? <laughs> I don't like the name drop, I really don't. But one of the greatest men in my life is Bishop Jakes. And I flew out the other day just to have dinner with him. We sat in a room in a restaurant by ourselves, we closed the door for four hours. Cried and wept. He can just speak, and it pins me to the wall. And there are other people that speak, and nobody cares. Nobody listens, and nothing happens. <laughs> what is the difference? One has a weight behind it, and one doesn't. And if you do not yet have a weight behind your words, it would be best that you be quiet. Because I think what made the walls of Jericho fall was not so much their shout on the seventh day, but can you walk around your problem and be quiet for six days? Jesus, Lazarus, whom thou loveth, is sick. This is my paraphrase. I don't have time to read it. He's not sick. This is for glory. <laughs> this is for glory. Jesus hangs around four days. One of those inexplicable moves that only in the mind of Christ would he know himself. Jesus shows up late. Now he's dead. Everybody is freaking. 
if you would have been here. He is not dead. He sleeps. Didn't I tell you that this was for glory? Go home and read the story. See, what's going on is never really what's going on. All you can see is you and your husband fight all the time. All you can see is I'm getting hit in my finances. All you can see. What's going on is for these light and momentary afflictions. What I think is going on is working for me. A greater weight. Ooh. Now some of you are begging for a new glory, but you need to understand. The affliction is heavy, but the glory is heavier. People don't lose their mind on their journey. They lose their mind when they get the glory. Because before you want to go to another glory, you need to ask, can you handle the weight of it? Because God is working for me a far greater weight of glory. For we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. Things which are seen or temporary, things which are unseen are eternal. For I consider these present sufferings not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be. He's not talking about heaven. It's never about the affliction. It's never about the suffering. In other words, what's going on is not what's going on. I know that's all you can see, but that's not what's happening. There's something entirely different God is up to than your present trouble. I'm, you're blinded by your trouble. You're blinded by it. Blinded by it. Let me just drop right here. Let me see. Here's a dime. If I hold this dime out here, I can still see everything in this building. If I start moving it closer, I can see about half of you. I can see about 20% of you. I can't see anything. Because most of the time, the things that are blinding us ain't worth a dime. Didn't I tell you this was for glory? Now this is going to be hard because I'm a faith guy now. I'm a kingdom guy and I'm a faith guy. I'm an old Pentecostal. I got so much mixture in me, I'm just soup. I was raised classical Pentecostal, then the word of faith guys got a hold of me, then Miles Monroe tutored me for six years, and now I don't know what in the world I am. <laughs> but let me play with your theology a little bit, especially the faith people. That you're going to have to take a deep breath to get this one. The reason Jesus waited four days, thank you, sir. That was bothering you, wasn't it? The reason Jesus waited four days and did not go heal him is because that glory had already been revealed many times. So if Jesus would have shown up while he was sick, it would have been the same glory. But nobody had raised the dead. So they think it's about Lazarus and sickness and death. And Jesus is trying to tell you what's going on is not what's going on. So Jesus shows up four days later and then raises him from the dead and then all of the onlookers have just been taken to 
they have seen a greater operation of the weight and authority of God in the earth. What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that sometime God will let it deteriorate on purpose. Because it's not about you. It's about glory. God is a glory hog. God is a glory seeker. The whole earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And I want to let some people in here know, have you ever had a situation or presently dealing with one in your life and you're doing everything you've been taught to do and it just keeps going can you imagine being best friends with Jesus and watching Lazarus suffer? Can you imagine the offense? Can you imagine the resentment knowing how much Lazarus loved him and they were friends and he dined there, he ate there, they fluffed pillows, Mary sat at his feet. Can you imagine? And then he won't come. And they sit there and they just watch him go down. Just watch him go down. So I want you to take off your mask a minute and your title and how many of your church is running. How much money you got or your status in your community. And let's get real because some of us, we have praised till our tongue fell off and we've gotten hoarse. We've fasted till we've lost weight. We've sowed seed till our bank account's dry. And it just keeps. I mean, if you may have seen my YouTube video of my son's testimony, I plead the blood over his door sill every night. I laid on the carpet, but that thing had him in its grips. And I watched it till it controlled every facet of his life and I couldn't understand because I knew everything to do and I'd been telling people what to do for a quarter of a century and I got something right in front of me and it just keeps going down. And it's so hard when you know God. But you got something in front of you that confuses you because no matter what you do, it keeps getting worse right in front of your face. How much time do I have, sweetie? I got zero time. Please don't leave because if I understand right, this camp meeting has no registration. And there is an offering. I beg you not to leave because a lot of times if you minister, people will take off. Please don't. I'm asking you, please don't. For two reasons. It's disrespectful to the anointing. Number two, I don't want pastor to look at it and say, well, when that Ron Carpenter comes, we ain't going to get no money. I know that. Because he's just going to preach and minister. But please don't. But I got to pray for some people. I don't have the time to call you to an altar, but I think if Pastor Parsley was sitting in this room, he would afford me this. I know what it is to come in here with your new suit and your makeup and your heart be broken. Some of you that have followed my life, I'm no stranger to sorrow. I'm no stranger to looking at something confused and have no idea why it just keeps going down right in front of my face. And I'm praying and I'm believing and I'm fasting and I'm, do I have any sin in my life? Have I done anything wrong? I'm examining my ways and it just keeps getting worse. Bring that pen up just a good bit. If you would sound, man, I need some, put, give me some sound, brother. Give me some sound. Make it bigger. There we go. Thank you. If you're in this building and you've been watching something deteriorate, and no matter what you do, it just seems to get worse. 
I've been transparent with you. Lay apostle and bishop inscribed on your Bible down for a minute. And say the reality is I've got trouble. I'm in the middle of suffering and affliction. I'm, I'm so confused. Why God has not shown up yet, I have no clue. If that's you, I can't invite you down here, but I need you to stand right where you are. 